Hello, friends. I am I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm seeing so many names of people I love and admire in the chat. I joked earlier, I don't know if all of you saw this, but I was like, there are too many beautiful people. I just, I think we all just need to go home now. We're done. Like we gathered all of the beautiful people. <laughs> we can just go home. <laughs> so I want to remind you, as the slide said earlier, if we were in person, this would be a big hoopla. It's like the passing of the peace in church. Uh, you look great this morning. I don't know if anyone's told you that, but you look amazing. So just take that in for a second. Just sit with it. Most of these creative mornings events during the, um, what I have been calling the partridge in a pear tree um, or the pandemic, as we more commonly refer to it. I've been in my pajamas under blankets and drinking tea. So this is for you. I am not in bed for you. That is how much I love you and how much I love Creative Mornings DC. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, and speaking of hair, which I blew dry for you this morning, like again, that's how much I love you. I wanna start our conversation today with hair. And now what does resilience and naming have to do with hair? Well, we shall find out. So a few years ago, I was living in rural Bulgaria, which is actually a really incredible place to live. So if you ever get the chance, please go do it, go visit. Bulgaria is amazing. So I was living there and teaching English and it had been nine months since I had gotten my hair cut. I didn't speak the language well enough to nuance how I wanted layering or what vibe I wanted. So I was just putting it off, putting it off. And it got really long, really, really long, longest I'd ever had it. And I decided it was time for something drastic. I wanted a pixie cut. I thought about it for years. I wanted to go like completely different look and feel. It was time for a pixie cut. So asked around as you do, who gets their hair cut where, what's going on, where's the place to be. Went to a salon, sat down in the chair and I told the two women, all right, I'm ready for a big change. I want a pixie cut, show them some pictures. And they looked at each other and they looked at me and they looked back at each other and kind of shifted their weight a little bit. And they said, are you sure? Have you asked your boyfriend? You, you know men like women with long hair. Let's give you a bob instead. Let's not do the pixie cut. Let's give you a bob and then we'll go shorter and then maybe you can see if you like it. I knew in that moment, I didn't want them touching my hair. No, don't touch it. So I acted like I had gotten scared off and I was like, no, 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 okay, I'm too nervous. I'm not gonna do this. So I left the salon and decided to go find somewhere else. Someone who uh, might see me, might give me a shot at getting a really dramatic haircut. So I visited several other salons over the next couple of weeks, both in my city and in a nearby city. Same conversation. Are you sure? Have you asked your boyfriend? Men like women with long hair. Let's give you a bob instead. I was frustrated at this point and starting to get stubborn. I'm a Taurus, it comes naturally. Told a friend about it. I'm like, what? no one will cut my hair. He said, I know the place. She's been trimming my beard for years. I will take you. Just come, I'll set the whole thing up. So he came as my translator. And we walk into this tiny salon with one chair and it really seemed like it was actually the entrance to someone's living quarters. It, it wasn't a big fancy place. It was a chair in what felt a little bit like a living room. I sat down and the woman starts talking to my friend Cal and she, she asks him, I don't understand. You said that no one would cut her hair. What's wrong with her hair? She seems to have very normal hair. What's the issue? So we explained the whole story, how no one wanted to, to give me a pixie cut. And she threw up her hands. I was just like, like she really was confused. She didn't understand what was happening. And she said, if you want to change your life, it is my job to help you. If you want to change your life, it is my job to help you. And I said, you can do whatever you want to my hair, <laughs> whatever. She put it in a braid. She cut off the braid. Bold move, bold first move in a haircut. And proceeded to style the chicest look I had ever had in my life to that point. 
And when I left that tiny one chair salon and was walking back to my apartment, I kept looking at myself in the windows of buildings as I passed because I was like, oh my God. Okay, it wasn't this long. I couldn't actually flick it. But you get the vibe. I was very, I was very into it. I was so in love with this new energy, with this lightness to me. She really gave me a gift in that moment. I had known that a haircut could be a transcendent spiritual experience. And it was that because she named it. She said it out loud. She put the words to what was happening. She did three things in that moment. The first is that she gave me a gift. She verbalized what I was actually after. She saw what was happening and said, oh no, I see you. This is about uh, confirming a change that's already been taking place. Like, let's make it happen. Let's make it visible. I see it. She also let me see her. I saw her as someone who could cut my hair and do it in the way that I needed, the way that I was looking for. And she gave herself a gift. She elevated haircutting, which there are millions of people, we're mammals, so most of us have hair. So there's a, we need a lot of hairstylists in this world. We need a lot of people cutting hair. But she elevated her work from a thing that we all need, a commodity, into an art form. She took her work and made it into something specific, made it into something real. And that is the moment that the haircut happened, not when she took scissors to my head. And I think about her all the time. I think about that. I've never really recovered from that haircut. Like it, it changed a lot for me. And the reason is how, I think how I relate to the power of that moment from her. I think of her as someone who is unboxable. She's not defined by cutting hair. It's just a thing that she does, an expression of this deeper and truer work of changing lives and helping people do that. She's an unboxable creative. And when I think of the people in this room, but the people I know personally and the people I've met at Creative Mornings, Shout out to Tony O'Boyle, who is my forever coffee line friend. It's, we are unboxable. We are not defined by the industries that we exist in, the industries that we create in, the genres that we call our own. And there's this sense, there's so much pressure, especially in this language around like branding ourselves or defining our career trajectory. There's so much pressure to figure it out and to put a label on it. But what I want us to think about is not our labels, but our names. How do we find a name that doesn't confine us, but instead expands our possibility? There are a lot of gifts to choosing this way of life. You get to define, you get to choose what work you wanna be doing. You get to define how you wanna show up in the world. You get to give yourself permission to evolve and change. You don't have to play by other people's rules. And there are challenges. How do we make decisions in this kind of life where there's no set path? How do we find resilience and make it through the tough times? Again, there's no roadmap. And how do we make sure that we see ourselves and that others see us? Because we can't make the change that we wanna make if we haven't said where we're going, if we haven't said what we're trying to do, if we haven't done the deeper work of naming what already is inside of us. There's a reason it's so difficult. If this were easy, we all would have done it and this talk would not be happening and we could just go home. <laughs> we all, we're already home, it's soon. Aside from that, there are some real challenges and there's not a single person on earth who finds it easy to name their work. Because again, we would have done it already. But there are some very good reasons or uh, scientific reasons, very understandable reasons for why this is difficult. And that has to do with the nature of language. When we're naming ourselves, we're using words and we're tapping into the language part of our brains. And there are some very specific ways that that is structured 
that is both incredibly magical and sometimes limiting. So the first is that language forms in dialogue. Language only forms and evolves when we are in interaction with other people, when we are in conversation. This can feel like it's actually a lovely part about language, but it can feel like a barrier because we have, uh, at least in America, we have so many stories about the individual genius that we think that we are supposed to be off on our own in a cabin in the woods generating new possibility or coming up with our own name or we're great communications people like we can talk to anyone about anything but we still have a hard time naming ourselves that's because language is about dialogue and the other part of language is while it's simultaneously a dialogue oh a point about a point about dialogue think about how you learned how to speak in the first place i love this detail which is why i'm going back for it you learned how to speak when an adult got in your face as a baby and made sounds back and forth with you. That is how language developed in your brain. You figured out that sounds you were making back and forth meant something, could cause changes. If you combine certain sounds, it started to have meaning. So we're supposed to learn language and dialogue. It's literally how we learned it in the first place. But the other piece, is that language is also uniquely wired in our brains. When you figured out what a tree was, you figured out it was a tree at a very specific moment in time connected to a particular person who was helping you make that connection to a particular tree. So if you think about trees, you are drawing up a whole lifetime of experiences specific to that idea, specific to you. So language, while in dialogue, while this bridge between us, is also something that we have to individually figure out. We have to define the words for ourselves. And the reason we have to do this work or why it's so wonderful when we do this work is because language is responsible for how we perceive and how we act. Now, how do we know this? There are some incredible research studies on the way that language impacts decision-making and perception. So the first time I ever heard about this was many years ago, and I listened to a radio lab story called Why the Sky Isn't Blue. I will share a link to it later. It's a ridiculously cool story, but they start by talking about William Gladstone. He is a English prime minister obsessed with Homer, obsessed. Like if there was fan fiction in William Gladstone's days, he would have been writing Homer fan fiction. Like that's his level of commitment to this author. And after reading the Odyssey for the millionth time, he recognized that there was something missing. Oh my God, Eric just dropped it in the chat. Look at that speed, Eric. Ridiculous, so good. Okay, so <laughs> Gladstone realized that there was not a word for blue in any of Homer, no blue. Instead, things that we think of as blue, like maybe water or the sky, always were described with a different color. So if it was a stormy sea, it was the wine dark sea, which is a badass description, but not blue. And he was like, what, what's the deal with this? And then another linguist named Geiger came along and he said, okay, well, the Greeks didn't have blue but the rest of us got it eventually. So when did we all get the color blue? And he looked at all of these ancient languages, ancient Chinese, the Vedic hymns, the Hebrew Bible, ancient Icelandic, none of these texts have the color blue in them, zero. Exception being the Egyptians. So why was that? It seems, this is a hypothesis, it seems that we have words when we make something into a tool, when we have the access to replicate it and do something with it, we find a word for it. The Egyptians had a word for the color blue because they had a dye from a plant that made the color blue. The rest of those cultures didn't have access to blue in a natural form that could be used into, to make things. What we have words for changes how we see. What we see changes what we have words for. It's a, it's a dialogue, it's a dialogue, dialectic conversation between 
that language in our brains. To make this even cooler, <laughs> there's this guy named Jonathan Winower from MIT who did a study on different language speakers and their ability to recognize different color tones. So he had slightly differentiated shades of blue and he had a group of Russian native speakers and a group of English native speakers. By native, we mean what they started talking with from childhood. They grew up, that was their first and primary language. That's what I mean to say. And Russian speakers were significantly faster at differentiating between similar shades of blue. What was that about? In Russian, in conversational Russian, there are two completely different words for light blue and dark blue. In English, we differentiate with adjectives rather than a different name. This study is really, really cool. I recommend you go read it. Literally, if you Google Russian MIT blue, it comes up. It's worth the read, it's worth the read. This suggests that what we have a specific name for we have the ability to see and distinguish between different pieces. We, we can, our brains have a category that let us make decisions based on what we have names for. And we don't just have to receive names for things. We can go make names. We can go figure out who we are. So as an unboxable creative, what is your shade of blue? This is what I want us to talk about. Because when we name our work, we can be seen, we can be known. When we name our work, we can find a way through. When we name our work, we have an anchor to hold on to. In the true spirit, of the panini pandemic partridge in a pear tree um the trash guys are here they're gonna take trash out of my basement so if you hear crashing it's fine my building's not falling down it's just it's just the truck i love it life is too good so how do we find a name for our work i want to share a concept from of all things machine learning listen i majored in english machine learning is not my area of expertise but I love science terms because science terms just steal from regular conversational language and then they go make it mean something really fancy. And then it becomes a new type of metaphor that we can steal back. I love science terms. And this term from machine language is the ground truth. What this refers to is training data for algorithms. So the information that you feed a math equation so it can recognize patterns. So it can recognize between shades of blue, as it were. You've all seen this in action. When you have to log into that one account for the millionth time and it asks you to choose the difference between a motorcycle and a lamppost, you have to choose the motorcycles instead of the lamppost. That is an example of this concept from machine learning. You are doing two things in this moment. The first is that you're proving that you're not a robot. Congratulations but you're also teaching a robot algorithm on the other side, how to recognize reality, how to tell the difference between shadows in the world and the motorcycle. This is teaching self-driving cars how to make decisions, decisions, they're not sentient beings yet, how self-driving cars can navigate the world as they move through it. So there are two things happening. You're demonstrating who you are and you're teaching the algorithm. You're giving experience from your life, your lived experience of the difference between a motorcycle and a lamppost. And you are teaching it what reality is and how to discern between the different pieces. This is what I want us to dig into. You have access to this kind of information on yourself. This comes from your lived experience. So, the question that I want you to ask is what does it feel like to feel most like me? When do I feel most alive? 
And when have I felt that feeling? What has that experience been like? It is in those stories that we can find the name for our work. Where we are most alive is where we best contribute. Where we are most ourselves is our greatest chance of meaning and success. And when we can name that aliveness in us, that is our chance to be seen and known, to be heard and understood, and to make the changes we wanna make. So I wanna tell you a story about this from my life. When I felt this feeling of aliveness, this ease, this total, <sighs> I was a senior in college and I was assigned to lead a discussion on Annie Dillard's essay, The Eclipse, a nonfiction creative writing class, hence the study of Annie Dillard, who was amazing, and I would also recommend you go read this essay. But I read the essay three times, and I took pages and pages of notes, and I had no idea what this essay was saying. It was literally just a story of an eclipse. So I made some really strong observations about the text and I came into the class for the discussion and I stood in front of the room and I said, I don't know what this essay is about, but I would like us to figure it out together. Here are some observations I've made. And what ensued was this really beautiful connective experience where we took language and we took our own lived experiences and we explored what an artist meant by the thing that they made. And there was so much permission in not having to decide one thing she was trying to say, but the plethora of things that she was trying to say. Like the, like literally Annie Dillard's sentence structure is just unreal. So I love Annie Dillard. I got a really great grade on that particular assignment, but that wasn't where the joy was. The joy was leaning against that front desk and saying, I don't know, let's figure it out together. So the way that I have named that, there are two, two aspects to how we name things. There's how we name things for ourselves internally, our private language. If language is uniquely wired in our brains, we need to find the words that make sense for our combination of neural firings when we hear language. So we need to do the internal work and then we translate that externally to language that help other people trust us and want to be part of what we're doing. So there's two steps. There's internal language, external language. So my external language, you heard at the beginning when Raquel introduced me. I work with unboxable leaders to name their work so they can be heard and known as we create the world as it could be. That's how I would say that to someone else. That helps the people I work with see me and know what I care about. But internally, if I'm trying to describe that elusive element of that story of being in a classroom and talking about an essay. I've verbalized it for myself this way, that I hear what we're trying to say so we can do what we're trying to do. I might not put that on a website. I'm sharing this because I feel like I want to here, but you really never have to put this language on a resume or your LinkedIn. This is language for you. What does it feel like when you feel like you? What is the connective thread between those experiences and how will you name it? There's a very simple structure to this sentence. So you go through all these experiences and then you put it into a name, a sentence, and it has two pieces to it. I verb, so that. So you saw this in my sentence. I hear, so that we can do what we're trying to do. I verb, so that result. And I know at least half of you have your pens and papers out and you are attempting to fill in this sentence as we speak. I would like you all to breathe. This process is not meant to be done in 30 minutes. I am introducing you to a process that I hope that you will take with you and reflect on. So don't be like, oh my God, I have to figure this out in five minutes. This talk's almost over. No, that's not how this is gonna work. You are exactly where you're supposed to be. Thank you, Reggie Black, for this well-placed art piece. <laughs> and you're good. You're good. You don't have to figure this out right now. So just stay with me. I want to introduce you to my friends, Frank and Victoria. 
who for me represent the resilience and the hope and groundedness that can come from naming your work. Frank and Victoria are professional dancers in Pittsburgh. And a few years ago, they were becoming more and more popular in their style called West Coast Swing. And there's a very expected path in the West Coast Swing community that when you get good enough and you become well known that you go on what we call the circuit, which is a bunch of different events around the country and around the world. You compete, you win more points, you become more well known, you have students all over the place. This is how you make ends meet. This is what a career looks like. But they had parallel careers. Victoria was a nurse and Frank was a chef. And they knew they loved their dancing and they knew they loved their students in Pittsburgh. And they were intrigued by these new opportunities that were coming up, but they weren't sure what to do with them. So they went into their lived experience. They said, when have we felt most alive as a partnership, as individuals, what holds those experiences together? And the result was this statement. So I verb, so that. In this case, it was a we verb. We create from our roots to build soulful communities. We create from our roots to build soulful communities. Externally, they just started describing themselves as soulful community builders. With this new name and understanding for what had always been true about them, they had always been soulful community builders. This was not aspirational. This was hard data. This was real. They started saying no. They started saying no to opportunities that weren't going to sustain their lives in Pittsburgh. They said yes to their city. They said yes to investing in a studio space. They said yes to their local students. They said no to traveling on the road every weekend. Victoria kept her work. Frank realized that dance was his primary passion and he started to let the chef work go and put more time into teaching. And then of course, the pandemic. Dance disappeared, especially partner dancing. Like we're not holding hands and doing anything anymore. <laughs> But being soulful community builders didn't go away. It changed the way the expression of who they were changed. Victoria ended up taking work as a travel nurse so she could be in places with lower trained nursing staff and be part of their response to COVID. Frank found another part time job to help make ends meet. He's now doing landscaping and all kinds of other things in his parallel career. They were able to move houses so they have a bigger space for the future so they can safely teach people in their home. Soulful community building has nothing to do with their artistry. Their career and their expression will change a million times over the course of their lives. But this anchor, that helps see them through. And I just, I just want, I want all of us to have act. Okay, hmm, sorry, I'm getting riled up. I want all of us to have access to that kind of clarity. And we do, it is available to all of us. We all have the ability to go into our experiences and start naming what those pieces are. I just really, really want more of us to name our shades of blue, to see ourselves the way my stylist in Bulgaria saw herself, to verbally say out loud that this thing that I do is about changing lives, not just cutting hair to meet a style or a trend. And some of us come pretty close, but there can be this hesitancy and fully leaning into it and fully defining it. Because once you define it, it becomes this thing that you can't unsee. You know it, and then you have to make choices about it. Sometimes that's scary. But at the end of the day, this is how we find our way through. It's by doing the deep internal work of putting words to what is already true about us, to making it visible, to making it concrete. Almost a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, Kyle Dargan spoke here at Creative Mornings, and he said that he hoped the pandemic would invite artists into their role as essential workers. There's nothing I wanna see more than that. We're not going to be named by outside people, nor do we want to be. We don't want the labels that the economy decides to put on us. 
what they decide essential looks like. We get to decide that. We get to name who we are and what we do and why it matters. This is what it means when I say that I believe words are action. What we put words to changes how we see, it changes what we do. It is not separate from action, it is part of. It is a visceral, physical experience. Language is hardwired into our bodies. It's not abstract, it's tangible, it's tactile. And we can do something really, really interesting with it. So, what are you gonna do? What is your shade of blue? Thank you.